your host, Jay Poole, and this is Pot Stirrer Podcast. everyone and welcome to Pot Stirrer Podcast, where politics, religion, and history collide, and it's not always polite. Recently, I engaged in a wonderful conversation with theology professor, author, and Christian faith leader, Obrey M. Hendricks Jr., PhD. Professor Hendricks is the author of the book, Christians Against Christianity, How Right-Wing Evangelicals Are Destroying Our Nation and Our Faith. It was truly a fulfilling and edifying discussion, and I'm thrilled to share this with you. Thank you very much for listening. Enjoy. Today, I'm here with my special guest, Obrey M. Hendricks, Jr., Ph.D. Professor Hendricks is a visiting scholar in the Departments of Religion and African American and African Diasporic Studies at Columbia University. He is also the author of The Politics of Jesus, Rediscovering the True Revolutionary Nature of Jesus' Teachings and How They Have Been Corrupted, Universe Bends Towards Justice, Radical Reflections on the Bible, the Church, and the Body Politic, and Living Water, a Novel. Today, we will have a conversation about his newest book, Christians Against Christianity. How Right-Wing Evangelicals Are Destroying Our Nation and Our Faith. Welcome, Obrey. Thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure. My pleasure. So what inspired you to pursue this particular line of research and thought? And what led you to writing Christians Against Christianity? Well, you know, I was, really, I guess, overcome with a real sense of of, of, of outrage um, at what I uh, see right wing uh, evangelical Christians doing uh, to this nation, to our, our democracy, to our society, and also how they are so uh, misrepresenting what the message of Jesus was, the biblical witnesses, you know, to the point that uh, what they present to the world is, is really the antithesis of what the gospel teaches. The gospel teaches love. These folk, um, you know, they they are held together by those for whom they have no love, those that they uh, oppose. You know, the gospel talks about truth. You must know the truth. And and these folks support uh, a gentleman who would, who's just a pathological liar, and some of them hold him up as, as a messiah, um, literally. It, this is just, it's, it, I was just horrified. And outraged by what I saw, and I, you know, I thought I had to um, to do what I could to try to address it. That definitely makes a lot of sense. And give listeners some a little bit more background as well. Um, besides your academic background, you're also an elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church or AME Church. Yes, I am. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. besides having this academic background, you also have a faith background, a Christian background as well. Well, yeah, I, I do. And as you know, in the, uh, the introduction to um, Christians Against Christianity, I talk about the importance of that to me and, the, uh, and, and how that pushed me to write this book as well. You know, um, I grew up in the Christian church. I grew up Baptist and I saw um, what the faith is supposed to be. And, mm-hmm. uh, you, know, it, uh, you know, people who are loving and I'm talking about my parents' generation who we're faced with much worse, worse racism than we're faced with today. My parents, you know, grew up in Jim Crow, um, Virginia, and uh, and 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 many people in in the the church were from the South as well. Yet they were loving people. They weren't they weren't hateful. They they had um, uh, they did the best to, to nurture us, uh, you know, children to be the best human beings that we could, so that we could contribute to society. And, uh, and be a credit to everyone, you know, and I, I saw this in, in action. And then I see these, these people standing up talking about how, how they are so much Christians and their, and their leaders are, are, are talking about themselves being emissaries of Christ. And they're doing the exact opposite of what I saw 
as the real practice of Christianity. And it just can't stand. It has to be opposed. So, yes, I'm opposing it on faith grounds as well, not just on political grounds, but on faith grounds as well. Mm -hmm. That's one, like a reason why I wanted to highlight that because you're coming at this topic, not just as an academic, but also as a man of faith. I think that that's something that's important to highlight. In my podcast, I talk about my backgrounds in political science. Mm -hmm. And so I have that type of background, but then I'm also a Christian. I came to faith as an adult. I was an evangelical and then I left evangelicalism, but I'm still a Christian. In political science, when we discuss American religion and political behavior, and when we're conducting and interpreting empirical research, a distinction is made between white evangelical Protestants and non-white evangelicals. Mm -hmm. Now, for myself as a Christian, as a Black woman, and as a former evangelical, having been a part of the evangelical tradition for many years, both in white and in other non-Black spaces. I've experienced that disconnect that we're kind of talking about. Mm -hmm. The disconnect. Yeah, like that disconnect between our understanding of the faith and what Jesus taught versus what we see in terms of how that's acted upon, particularly with Christian nationalism. Okay, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So you talk about in the book this distinction between white evangelicals and black evangelicals mm -hmm. and the fact that comparatively few black evangelicals embrace the Christian nationalism piece that seems to be endemic, that seems to be overrun in American evangelicalism. Uh, why do you think that is? Well, Right-wing evangelicalism is, um, you know, as an underpinning of white nationalism and white supremacy um, and racism. And, you know, their, their vision of, uh, their nostalgic vision of uh, making America great again, or, or however they might articulate that, it really harkens back to a time that was not good for black people. I mean, they're harkening back to a time where their privilege was less challenged. And uh, less in battle, and, um, and their vision doesn't have us in in mind. And you know, and, and black people can can feel that. Not only that, white evangelicalism often is 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 uh, you know, the right wing evangelicalism is often so oppositional. You know, folk can folk can feel that. Um, there's a difference between Afro Christianity and Euro Christianity, in my experience and observation, mm -hmm. and. Because um, Afro-Christianity, you know, Black folks' Christianity in, in America was never aimed in opposition to anyone or to oppress anyone. Quite the opposite. But white Christianity largely was, you know, used to to, um, to subjugate and, and to oppress and certainly to, um, to push, you know, their vision of who God is and who Jesus is on everybody else. I mean, for instance, um, as, as recently as a few years ago, Megan Kelly said, everybody knows Jesus is white. <laughs> oh yeah. I remember that. I mean, which, which is, which is ridiculous in, in, in the Middle East, especially 2000 years ago. And right. so, you know, that's the difference. I mean, you know, we, and we see the difference mm -hmm. uh, and feel the difference. And so, so black folks aren't, aren't really, um, not our, our, we're not, um, uh, seduced by it. But, you know, but we're not fooled by, by white Christianity. It's just not what we know the faith uh, in God and in Jesus Christ to be. Mm. And I'm speaking generally now about right wing evangelicalism. Right. I mean, white, white, white evangelical, white right wing evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not paying all of the white evangelicals with that same broad brush now. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so. One of the things that you discuss in the book is the attack on the call to social justice by evangelical commentators. One of them that you mentioned was John MacArthur. Um, MacArthur in particular called social justice anti-biblical. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned the Southern Baptist Convention panel that was held a couple of years ago called 
dangers of social justice in evangelicalism. <laughs> now, that one, I'll be honest, when I read your book, before you even mentioned that panel, mm-hmm. when you started talking about this pushback against social justice by right wing evangelicalism, that was one of the first things I pictured. Mm-hmm. And I remembered that panel because I remember a couple of years ago when it was advertised. Because besides their take on social justice, the ad revealed that all five panelists were quite notably Caucasian men. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So in the book, you say in regards to these critiques, quote, social justice is not a Trojan horse for secular ideologies. It is not, as an article by one Georgia pastor says, an attack on the sufficiency of scripture. It is central to the biblical witness. It simply is not possible to fully understand the teachings of Jesus without a clear understanding of the centrality of social justice to the Bible. Mm -hmm. So could you please expound a little bit on what you mean by this? Yes, yes. Well, you know, as I try to point out in Christians Against Christianity, is that you know people like me go out there are just woefully uninformed and underinformed. And a lot of it has to, to do with perspective, and some of it has to do with trans, translation issues. You know, for one thing, what they never talk about is that the most often occurring, most often used and invoked ethical concept in the Bible is justice. Okay? And that is, you know, that's just, just central. No other term is, is used as much as invoked as often. And then, but there's a second term, sadaqah, which is translated as uh, righteousness, all, um, often with the connotation of personal piety, uh, which is, and, 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 but it really means doing justly in society or doing right by people in society. And it is the, the second most invoked ethical concept in the Bible. And, mm-hmm. but then the two of them, are together, they are the most often invoked pairing of terms in the Bible. And so when you talk about justice and um, doing right or doing justly in society, I mean, what the pairing, the most off, the, the most off occurring pairing in, in the Hebrew Bible really means social justice. Mishpat, Sadaqah, justice, doing justice in society, that's social justice. And then when you add the very seminal proclamation that we see in Leviticus and we see uh, echoed by Jesus to love your neighbor as yourself, uh, which means, which is really egalitarian because it's saying you want to love your neighbor as yourself. You want the same rights and opportunities and access to the good things of life for, for your neighbor as you want for yourself. You add them all together and what you have is this found, ethical foundation of the Bible of egalitarian social justice being the foundate, ethical foundation of the Bible. Well, MacArthur doesn't seem to realize that. And not only that, MacArthur and the people who think like him, they are so afraid of social justice, this is my opinion, um, because it threatens their ascendancy in the faith and in society. It threatens the status quo. And that is why... Um, when they attack this concept of social justice, they don't offer an alternative to it. They they just right. want want to um they just want to kill the whole notion, and so things can stay as as they are. And that is uh, I'm not saying it's, it's, it's blasphemy, but it is it is absolutely wrong. It absolutely flies in the face of of the gospel's call. Well, the Bible's called and they just as roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Right. Yeah. And, and this really makes me think of something that I've seen from people that think this way is the narrative is that there's a juxtaposition between social justice and what they term biblical justice mm-hmm. as if they're not the same thing. But the way that they talk about it is, I guess the way I hear it is that it's almost as if they're trying to talk the idea of justice out of existence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, biblical justice for them often is 
an uh, alternative translation of mishpat because the term means justice and judgment. But it means judgment in, in the sense of, of bringing things into balance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like the scale, scales of, of, of justice. But they act like justice is just judgment for those who don't think like they think. You know? <laughs> yeah, they I noticed that. <laughs> they don't think about it in, in, in terms of making society more, more just and more lovely. It's always, you know, opposition. And their rhetoric today um, in the uh, public sphere, the public square is, it's, it never mentions justice, never mentions love. It's not loving at all. It's divisive. It's just, it's the uh, antithesis of what the gospel stands for. Yet, they're so quick to, to invoke judgment upon others. But Jesus had one primary mode of judgment. In the Gospels, and it's in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. And as, as you have not done it to the least of these, as you have not tried to feed and clothe and do right by people in society, particularly the least of these, I'm paraphrasing, of course, mm -hmm. uh, then you have not done it to me, so depart into hell. Now that's the judgment. So the judgment is, if you, if you're not, if you're trying to be, to treat People with loving justice and support them and give them help and, and be concerned about the common good and uh, that the weakest, the vulnerable are fine. Then you go, you sit on the right hand of God and you go to heaven. If you don't care about anyone else, if you don't try to help them, if you turn your back on folks or if you call people names, right? Or, or, um, marginalizing and demonizing and all that. Well, in Jesus' judgment, you're, you're on thin ice. You're on your way to the hot place. And, uh, they don't think about those things. It's almost like they have a different Bible because they don't pay, they don't pay any attention to it. Ask any of them. What is Jesus' main mode of judgment? Ask any right wing evangelical. And that's, they, they, they won't give you that answer. They'll give you, they give you an answer. Or it'll be a wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, so my next question is this. So storytelling is a way that concepts and events that appear abstract for many people can be made more real and more impactful. So in Christians Against Christianity, you discussed desegregation and how the resistance to desegregation brought about the religious right. And in this, you related it to your home state of Virginia. Um, specifically how in Prince Edward County, the county of your birth, desegregation orders led to the closing of all local public schools for five years. Um, this meant that white students were generally educated through private segregation academies, which were state funded, but black students, including some of your own relatives, either had to leave the area or simply weren't able to have access to K through 12 education, which had a long lasting effect on the black community there, even after the closure ended. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably one of the things in the book that really struck me because see, I've discussed on my podcast in other episodes that school desegregation took well over a decade after Brown versus board of education in 1954. Mm-hmm. And I even touched a little bit on segregation academies, but I'll be honest, I had no idea that the impact ran that deep. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think stories like that make it more real and you can really picture like, okay, this had real deep impact that just, it doesn't just disappear. It doesn't just go away with the passage of few years or even decades yeah you know it's uh it's one thing to say that jerry falwell founder of the moral majority was uh an arts segregationist uh during the 50s uh, it's another thing to look at just um how just how terrible the effect was the uh just how 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 terribly his actions afflicted black people. And so, I mean, that's why I, I told that story. My family had migrated north by the time they closed the schools. 
But, you know, I, there were people who never, there were, um, and mostly guys who were too embarrassed to go back to school five years later, sitting with kids in class five years their junior, right? Mm -hmm. uh, many had already joined the workforce. And, you know, they weren't, they, they weren't going back to school. And uh, the result is that Farmville, uh, which is the county seat of Prince Edward County, is the poorest city in the state to this day. As a result, that lives were, 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 were trashed, livelihoods were destroyed, human potential was destroyed. And this was done by the founder of the moral majority and one of the founding lights of today's modern right wing evangelical movement. And so the movement has rotten roots in rotten soil. And it's, it was founded and based on racism. And that stratum of racism uh, still characterizes right wing uh, evangelicalism to, to this day. I mean, listen to look at how racist the, the rhetoric has been uh, in support of, of Donald Trump and how racist they were against Mexicans and against Muslims and now against Asians. It's, it's really a, an, an evil situation that we have to start calling by its name. It's, it's an evil axis that um, we're faced with here in America. I definitely appreciate that historical background because I think it's important for people to, to really understand that. Like that's one of the, earliest episodes that I released was on the beginnings of the religious right and, and talking about how the way that they sort of retcon the beginnings of the religious right have been like, oh, well, you know, they get, they galvanized around the abortion issue. Mm -hmm. But then, but if you really kind of look back at the history, it really came down to maintaining tax exempt status for segregation academies. Like Bob Those Jones and Bob Jones, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and Jerry Falwell Sr. was in on on that. I think historical background and some of those experiential stories. I think that that really helps to understand, I guess, even more in full, kind of what was really happening and how it truly affected people. Yeah, yeah, and I mean that's something that's not talked about a lot, and that's why these folk can get can get a pass um, because we don't highlight the very um, the, the rotten roots of, of, of the movement. And so they can say that, well, what got us going was uh, Roe versus Wade. But as I show in, in the book, Christians Against Christianity, that that's a lie. Right. You know, the Southern Baptist Convention supported Roe versus Wade for years, as did some very important right wing evangelical leaders, as and and you know, as I write in the book, they that only changed when they decided in the late 80s that they would start focusing on abortion as a wedge issue to help them get more traction among their constituency in their quest to dominate American society. And so it was a strategic move, it wasn't a faith move because. Right. You know, evangelical supported Roe Ro versus Wade. Same with homosexuality. They, they wasn't that big a brouhaha. I mean, it was always uh, in opposition and oppression of, of gays, but it didn't become a major issue until they decided at that, that meeting in the late 80s that they were going to come up with some wedge issues um, to help them along the way to dominate American society. And look what's happened since then. It's like Christianity, like the only thing we're supposed to be concerned about is gay marriage and abortion. Right. Nothing, they don't talk about any, any other issues. They definitely don't talk about helping it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a lot of focus on what they consider political others. Yeah. And yeah. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of like control mm -hmm. and not a lot about, you know, taking care of other people and care for the least of these and compassion and things like that. So. Right, right, right. So I was surprised by a particular statistical finding you reported in your book um, in Christians Against Christianity. Mm -hmm. Specifically, when discussing immigration, you cite a 2015 poll where nine out of 10 evangelicals admit that scripture has no impact on their views regarding immigration reform. Mm -hmm. Now, that shocked me 
not because I, you know, not because I didn't necessarily believe it was true, but because respondents that are part of a Christian tradition that purports to hold the Bible in high regard would be that open to admitting that it doesn't really impact their views on this issue, yeah. which and, and by the way, like for a number of immigrants is a life or death issue, um, especially for those who are um, refugees. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I guess, so, I mean, to get to the point, and I think, you know, we can think of it in terms of this issue. We can think of it in terms of the election of Donald Trump. Like I think of when I first became an evangelical when, uh, yeah, late 90s. So when I started college mm-hmm. and the big thing that I remember from that period was hearing that relativism is bad, that right is right, wrong is wrong. There is such thing as right and wrong, and we're supposed to measure our politicians that way. And then we end up with Donald Trump like a decade and a half later. Mm-hmm. And how it went from sort of this rhetoric of we care about like the Bible and we take the Bible literally, and it's the inspired word of God. And and we can't go against that and we have to measure our leaders that way to, oh, well, you know, we're going to basically bend over backwards and contort, find ways to try to justify elevating someone to public office who essentially has said that he doesn't even ask God for forgiveness. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Like, and, and so I guess... Really, my question in terms of that, like, how did we even get here? Like, how do we even get to this point to where people are just kind of almost openly, particularly among right wing evangelicals, openly saying like, well, all the things that we've talked about before, you know, the Bible is our guide. And all of a sudden that doesn't, it's like, doesn't even matter anymore. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, that's, um, that's sort of part for the course for them, you know, because, uh, well, in, in in past years, they've uh, they have uh, they've engaged the Bible in the sense that they have contorted and distorted and, and twisted, you know, the biblical message. So they could they came up a way to support you know slavery, right, segregation, mm-hmm. and all that, and uh, and to support uh, the depredations of capitalism, like they are of God's will. And in this case, though, um, with, when it comes to Immigrants, I think part of, of, of the boldness of saying that the Bible doesn't, doesn't really influence them is number one, with Trump, all, all, all reason and proof and everything thrown out of the window. And all that was left was what served people's interests. What I'm getting at is that what the, these people are, it shows that they are really more ideological Christians than Christians of faith because um, they're willing to jettison anything in the Bible that does not uh, fit their uh, their interests, that does not further their interests, and Lord forbid if it opposes their interests. So it's like everything about the faith is refracted through the prism of their interests and their desire. And if it doesn't comport with their interests, their desires, um, no matter how bad they are, doesn't get through the prism, you see. And so that's that's how I understand that they are ideological Christians whose Christianity is determined by um, what fits their interests at all. How else can you go through the Bible? And, and you know, as I show through the book, you know, throughout the Bible, it talks about the importance of treating evangelicals right. The important to the point that even one of the reasons that I mean, not evangelicals, immigrants, excuse me, but uh, to the point that one of the reasons for the commandment. To, to tie is to um, be able to support immigrants. And I, and I quote that scripture in the book. But, you know, these folks act like it's not in the Bible at all. A lot of them don't read the Bible. Mm-hmm. They listen to their leaders and they listen to their desires. And you're right, how else could they support a man who does, who said he, he's never repented? So it wasn't, he's never accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And, and that's supposed to be the bottom line for all of them, but they don't care. Because yeah. what? Because to have this, this sick, lying sociopath in the White House 
who every day um, violates the seven deadly sins in his person. To have him in the White House, they don't care because it, it serves their purpose. And so that's why they want him back, you know, despite the fact that there's there's no legal or any other basis for him to remain president. They don't care, though. They don't care if the scriptures say, they don't care if the laws say, all they care is what about is what they want. That is not the gospel, now is it? It's not. I can look at all these other things and it's like, okay, that's one thing. You know, no one's without sin, right? It, you know, except for Christ. But the thing is, is that him saying that he had no need for forgiveness. And I'm just, I remember reading that and I just, how are they saying that? Oh, he's, he's a Christian. And is and it's like, that's like the very baseline thing is like to understand the need for a savior. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he, he says that no, if he does something wrong, he just, He'll just do better next time. In other words, he forgives himself. He does the forgiveness. <laughs> right. You know, he repents to himself. <laughs> As someone who feels that historical context is so important to understanding how we got here socially, politically, and in terms of our Christian faith institutions, what I enjoyed the most about Christians Against Christianity is the historical background on the evangelical movement in the United States and the development of modern right-wing evangelicalism. An overarching theme I got from this, and I think from the book in general, is that much like Christianity as a whole, there have always been these competing strains within the evangelical tradition. Mm -hmm. So for some, their faith inspires them to seek and fight for equality, for justice, for advocacy for the marginalized, mm -hmm. and to show compassion to the least of these. Mm -hmm. And then there are others who have used it to perpetuate and maintain systems of inequality and oppression and to seek power for themselves and then to find ways to justify all of it, as we've talked about. Right. And given this, I'll be honest, the future of evangelical Christianity is like the future is, is a thought I struggle a lot with. Mm. Mm. Do you do you think that evangelical Christianity is redeemable? And if so, what do you think that would look like? Well, you know, right wing evangelical Christianity, I don't I don't see it as I don't see it as any more redeemable than white supremacy is. Um because um one is shot through with the other. Um you know, I, I now, that doesn't mean that there that there won't be folks who will. There, I have to believe there are folks who are going to realize how wrong the evangelical thought and right wing evangelical thought and theology is. And then there are some who don't care whether it's wrong or not; it serves a purpose. But there are those I have to believe there are going to be those who are going to who are going to leave, and it's the, the numbers are shrinking every year. I, I think there will always be an unrighteous remnant of white evangelicalism, uh, right-wing evangelicalism, you know, because you know, racism has always existed in America and, and continues and will continue. But what I'm saying is that I don't think right-wing evangelicalism is redeemable because it doesn't seek redemption. It, it doesn't care whether it's right or not. All it cares about is power and privilege. and you can't redeem something like that. In the best scenario, it will just fade away. But I hate to use this analogy because it seems so overused, but I, it's a good one nonetheless. 80 years later, you know, there's still Nazism, you know. Right. Even after it was defeated and shown to be, you know, one of the greatest instantiations of, of evil in the history of humanity, it's still survives, and of course, it's gotten stronger under Trump. And so I think that this hateful right-wing evangelicalism is always going to survive. The question is, how influential will it be? Now, if they make up 14, 15% of, of the electorate, but look at how much power they have. Hopefully, their power will, will start to rely, and things will get more in, in balance. But I expect them to be around for a long time, and to be raising real hell 
for years to come. I think it's easy to see them being a major male factor in American politics um, and society for, for the next decade or two, easily, in my opinion, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely appreciate your perspective on that because um, it is something that I think about a lot. There's a community of people who that I've engaged with online who are former evangelicals. Mm-hmm. And some of us have stayed within the faith. And then there are others that have left it all together to either pursue different faiths or none at all. And so some one of the things that is sort of a topic of discussion in that community is that future of evangelicalism. I think it's one of those things for me, to be honest with you, that I, you could ask me today and I'll have one opinion and then the next day it'll be something else. So, you know, it's just something that, um, you know, I thought about. So I, I really appreciate your insight. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a tough, it's, it's a tough thing. It's, it's something we have to really wrestle with and, and continue to ask questions about, it. come to right. a deepest understanding we can about this, this terrible phenomenon. Right. Honestly, I genuinely enjoyed reading Christians Against Christianity. People that listen to this podcast will enjoy your book. Hmm. Because a lot of things that I hit on in several episodes of my podcast, you've discussed, and you share such a depth of faith and being able to talk from that perspective in a way that, you know, me as someone who, yes, I'm academically trained, but I'm not, I don't have that religious training. I can't speak to it in the same way. And so I think people will really get a lot from this. How would you like to see readers respond based on what you're seeking to impart in the book or from this conversation? Well, at the very least, I would like those who are influenced or under the influence of of right-wing evangelicalism, at the very least, I'd like to see them seriously engage in what they believe, be willing to to, to, to ask some questions and, and to look at the at the, that I share that, um, that, that challenge them and to look to see if it's really true or not. Because, um, the importance of, of faith is that, you know, we should be, we never know when, when God's speaking to us. We never know when there, something comes up that we can learn from. And so faithful people don't run from, from challenges. They, you know, challenges and commentaries on the faith. They deal with them, you know, and, and I, in my own experience, experience, I, I know that I've had to do that. And when I've done that, I've, I've profited. What I really would like to, the book to do, though, is to influence people to jettison these charlatans, these right-wing evangelical charlatans. And I'm not, and I'm not talking about all the, you know, the, the lay people, because, you know, some of them are too. But, you know, you have the, the Paula Whites. And the Franklin Grahams and Robert Jeffries, people like that, you know, they just need to be, um, to be ignored and jettisoned. And, they, and they, they really need, we really need to put them in their place. They need to be discredited so they can't keep misleading people. These are things. And then also, I just, I, I want to raise consciousness in the book. For instance, as you know, I, I engage a homosexuality in the Bible and, uh, you know, take great pains to show that in the final analysis, when you look at the, the few pronouncements in the Old and the New Testament that report that we say uh, calls homosexuality a sin, well, when you look at it in, in the historical context, you look at the language and all that, it becomes clear that it's not that clear. Right. I want, I want people to, to think about that and realize, well, wait a minute. I can't say the Bible says that homosexuality is a sin, whether I believe it or not. The Bible doesn't say that clearly. Um, the Bible does not does not say that abortion is a sin and those who commit a, a, a abortions are murderers. I'm not saying that abortion is right. I'm not suggesting one way or the other. But I want folks to understand, if they say there are people of biblical faith, then the Bible has to matter. What the Bible says and what it doesn't say has to matter. And I guess... In the final analysis, I would like Christian believers 
to take the Bible much more seriously and to look at the things that they believe, the things they support, the things they oppose um, on biblical grounds and see if the Bible really tells them to do that. And I said that was the last, but this is the last. You know that I dealt with this in the beginning in the, the introduction that I believe that it is a defensible case to be made that the core values, the heart of the Christian gospel can be found in love your Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, number one, because if we love our neighbor, I mean, loving our neighbors as ourselves is the only proof of whether we love God, let's face it. Um, and uh, if we don't love God's creation, then we don't love God. And also loving your neighbor as yourself is about living justly in the world, treating people right, having a being concerned about the common good. But then also the, the other, the, the second core value of the gospel I, that I, I would argue is Matthew 25, 31 through 46. You know, um, if you, God saying that if, if you are going to serve, the way to serve God is to serve those of your brothers and sisters, your neighbors in need. And if you turn your back on your neighbors in need, you're not serving God, no matter what you call yourself. I'd like for folk to consider that, to consider having an active faith about that actively seeks to make a better world and not just a better, uh, a better church or a better congregation or a more self-righteous person. And those, I think, are the main, the main takeaways for me, the main things I like to, for readers to take away from reading the book. That's definitely a lot of really, really good takeaways. And, you know, I really appreciate that. So lastly, what is next for you? Do you have any upcoming projects, articles, books, book tours? Yeah, there's a the tour though, thus far for the rest of the summer, Zoom events, right? Mm-hmm. Those uh, actually can be found on my website. Okay. It's Obrey Hendricks, Ph.D., O-B-E-R-Y-H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S, Ph.D. dot com. And then... Uh, you know, we'll be, be doing bookstores and colleges, you know, in, in, um, in person and, and a, a number of, of uh, uh, large church events to in person beginning in the fall. So, uh, you know, the, the response has been very, very gratifying and, you know, very strong. And we had, at one Zoom event, there were a thousand people on it. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, it's a book about, uh, that's just very current. This talks about what we're going through now and how we can try to understand it and address it. So listeners, definitely order Christians Against Christianity, How Right-Wing Evangelicals Are Destroying Our Nation and Our Faith. It's available at a number of locations, including Barnes & Noble, Penguin & Random House, and on Amazon. I'll have it linked in the show notes. Thank you very much, Obrey. I truly enjoyed our conversation. I really appreciate your time. Yes, I enjoyed it very much too. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for listening to Pastor Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Prime, or on your favorite podcast app. Visit potstirrerpodcast.com slash download, and the links are right there. If you subscribe, which is completely free, you'll be able to access new episodes as soon as they're released. If you enjoyed the podcast, please give it five stars and leave a review. And I'm sure you know this, but I'm on Twitter, and I enjoy tweeting. So follow me there, at potstirrercast. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free.